That logic one needs fixing. I don't think anyone reasonable that's actually played the game would disagree with that. No matter how much you love it, no matter how much you can tolerate its flaws, it's still just that, tolerating. A big reason for why it gets so much praise is because the people who manage to complete it are most often the types that end up liking it. The ones that like suffering, basically. Everyone else gives up before day two. It's not a perfect game by any means. Hell, if you were to say you didn't enjoy the game at all, I won't be surprised. I mean, it's buggy, pretty confusing and very, very boring and repetitive at times. It's more fun to think about having played than to think about playing or let alone actually playing. It's not uncommon for it to feel like a chore to simply boot up. I think the fact that I actively wonder whether I delude myself into loving Path Logic shows how unplayable it can be. Now I personally like it a lot. Even the gameplay, becoming incredibly rich can be rather addictive you see, but that's neither here nor there. The reality is that a lot of people likely can't go longer than playing one hour of it for every five hours they don't. Really. And that needs to be fixed. Fourteen years after the original release came Path Logic 2, and it's easily one of the most shocking and refreshing remakes of a game, for one that's already a complete cult classic. It is a remake, containing many of the twists and turns that you would expect if you played the original game before the new one. And yet, for all the bashing I do of Path Logic 1, I don't believe it's a clear answer as to whether you should head straight for the second. It's definitely the superior way to experience the story, there's no debating it. But the first is unique in its own way. Even after playing the second game, I went back to one and... The atmosphere, it immediately hit me like a truck. <laughs> There's just something special about it, and then I realized I have to walk for 10 hours. Still, you just have to experience it yourself, I really think it deserves at least one campaign's worth of playtime, and you perhaps won't have the will to go back and sit through such a different, though in many ways clearly inferior version of the game, after experiencing Path Logic 2. And yet, the fact that it is such, inferior, also makes it the best 4-play in the world. You can't imagine how good it feels to play a game that you love, but is also very poorly executed, after it gets executed amazingly. It almost feels as if it shouldn't be, as overdramatic as that sounds. Like you just took LSD or won 10 million dollars or switched from membrane to mechanical. But if you had to take my word for it, I'd say go for Pathologic 2. You can only experience the story for the first time once, and I'll admit I regret choosing one. Without spoiling anything, think about this. They had 14 years to ponder their project and decide what they regret, what they should have done differently, what would be better with the new technology we have today. Just by itself, the fact that we have more resources today makes it automatically better. If you're still wondering whether to buy the game or not, do it. It was made by a smaller studio and they deserve all the support in the world, I truly mean it. They are clearly passionate about their games, even if they expect their approach might push lots of people away and result in not the best reception from game journalists, they still go through with it. So if you intend to play the game, go do it right now, because I'm about to spoil absolutely everything. This is going to be a commentary, but not a purely chronological one. I might bring up something about Act 3 during the Act 2 segment, so beware if you haven't finished the whole game yet. This is not going to be a full commentary either, I don't intend on summarizing every single little quest. Finally, a lot of this game is very, very much left up to the player's interpretation. I wouldn't be surprised if someone took away a perfectly clear idea or theme that's present that the developers hadn't even thought of. So if you disagree with something that I state in that regard, keep in mind that in no way am I saying my reading on that is objective. Anyway, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss future uploads, like, comment, share, watch my other videos or whatever, and let's get started.
That Logic 1 was released in 2005 by Icepeak Logic. 2 on the other hand came out in 2019. It's a hard game to define, but if I had to do it I'd say open world survival, role playing and, in a way, simulator. It's only natural to compare a remake with its original and it's in part what I'll be doing during this video. I'm also kind of gonna be going through the major parts of the game as I said, we'll see what happens. This is obviously a very long video and it's possibly gonna get a little disjointed, it gets kind of difficult to keep track of what you've already mentioned, what you might be spoiling, but I'll try my best. Where Pathlogic 1 has you able to play as the Bachelor who respects your changeling, Pathlogic 2 only has the second, Artemi Burach. It's a smart choice, although I haven't played the changeling yet, it's rather clear why the side quests in her campaign, which is the third one, are literally copy pasted over and over for a majority of the days. Budget. But focusing on one character's view of the world, a distinct atmosphere, a single core experience, that is the best way to approach it. And besides, they can always release the campaigns for the trio later on, they have all the models, map and everything. You could also argue that the crew specs opens up more possibilities for an emphasis on survival mechanics than the other two. He's the only one that can open up bodies and take organs, he's the only one that can pick herbs and make brews from them, and he has a way harsher of a time than the bachelor due to the situation he's in when it comes to the story, with the reputation, whilst actually having a pretty well laid out story already, unlike the changeling. This is good, because this version of the game is definitely going for the survival part more, even if we were to exclude the things I listed. He's also way, way more fitting for exploring the step culture part of Pathlogic's world since he grew up here. You simply ought to listen to the soundtrack and look at the main menu to discern what the game is going for. The Bachelor isn't quite fond of it, you see. Anyway, you start off Pathlogic 2 with one of the weirdest yet most memorable tutorials in any game ever. First comes the theater, wherein this weirdo tells you you've already failed. He's also pretending like everything is a play, for some reason. This is what happens when you don't bully theater, kids. Then you find yourself in a hospital full of oddly well modeled corpses and a 7 foot tall plague doctor bird SCP looking thing. After leaving you walk the moonlit streets where people are being burned by soldiers, others lined up against the wall to be shot. Grown men and kids corpses alike fill the streets and you're hallucinating giant theatrical lights. Hopefully hallucinating. It's all backed by this amazing and grand though also haunting song. You loot some stuff, then enter the cathedral to make the final decision, as the bird person said. But you're late, it's all over, and they don't trust you besides. Under the try, Mark Immortel, the theater director asks, yes, you answer. The game tells you you're Artemi Burach, a surgeon who went away to study and is now arriving back to town on your father's urgent call. You'd expect things to get normal from now on, but it gets all the more confusing. You wake up on a train and a guy emerges from a coffin and asks you how you got in the coffin. You chat and go to sleep and wake up with the train already arrived. You meet a giant bull with giant bull balls and a ton of executors, that's what the bird dudes are called. You walk away and die from disease there and wake up in the train again. You speak to coffin guy once more and go to sleep. You wake up in a house full of the same characters you saw in the hospital, then they all transform into mimes. You get some water for a sick woman before waking up again. You also pass out not soon after, of course, and find yourself in a stone ring surrounded by half-naked tribal women, Mongolian men and warm looking things. You fight a random guy to show heart and then you literally exchange hearts. You wake up, go to sleep, arrive at your father's house, explore a bit while listening to his letter in audiobook form and relaxing laughter to go to sleep to. You know that I am growing old. I need an assistant. <laughs> Finally, you step off the train, get attacked by three guys, kill them, and apparently, it's for real now. You meet a dog-headed kid that tells you to not kill people, but instead beat them up until they run away. You lose less reputation like that when it comes to people that are justified in attacking you. This, and everything else up until now, has been a very subtle tutorial. You learn to talk, find out who's willing to talk, unlike the first game, here you can tab, which is nice when it comes to people you can speak twice to, loot items, get water, fight and trade. In fact, all tutorials in the game are like that, whether you're speaking to actual people or imagining that a toy is talking to you or having a dream, you rarely notice the tutorial's really there, it's a part of the world, not a part of the game. 
That logic one on the other hand was a huge information dump with an immediately funny breaking of the fourth wall. It was literally what a normal tutorial usually tells you but they put it in a text box set by a character. It's not, hey, you haven't been here in a long time, if you're hungry, food shops are scattered all around the town in case you've forgotten, but rather, make sure you eat food or you will starve to death, that's how humans work, got it? Again, it's cool, but with tutorials I prefer it simply through normal conversations or actually playing the game. Fault wall breaking can be reserved for other stuff, and trust me, there's a lot of it here too. But if you've played the original game, you know the first half of it is also a peek into the last day of the 12 day campaign and what it will look like if you're not careful. These are the corpses of all the important characters. This is exactly what the streets will look like and this is the one room where when you make the final decision, that of which ending you'll choose. If this is your first time with Pet Logic, you likely won't quite grasp the situation. As you progress through the game, however, you'll start recalling the prologue and slowly piecing together what it's about. And that's cool. The second part on the other hand is more of a troubled going in and out of it sleep simulation, though it still predicts some future events. Either way, you then get left at the station as we last said, free to explore and do whatever you want. You quickly realize how odd this town is. The time period, for example, is incredibly ambiguous. You truly start feeling like Borach, returning to a place that doesn't feel quite right. But it's also one of the most unique settings I've ever seen in a game and in any fictional story in general. A small town in the middle of nowhere, within the Russian steppe, with trains bringing in everything from faraway places. There are the kin, which are creepy and weirdly kind of cute warm things living in huts on the desolate outskirts of the town and also in the termitary. Speaking of the termitary, it resembles a Soviet era housing block, but it's right there with the abattoir, a giant ancient stone building revered by the kin, which is used for their pagan rituals and the slaughtering of sacred bulls, for no food can be grown here. We do have herbs though and herb brides, but also normal people, just regular gopniks hanging around, willing to trade a tourniquet for some water to help with their hang over. You'll meet some Mongolian looking guys. Vampires much? Not really. Oh and uh, rich people. Lots of thieves and also tragedians and executors. The former are the mime dudes and both reside within the theater. That lot likes to hang out pretty much everywhere. Also lots of kids? Kid culture is huge around here, they really like being independent. One side identifies with animals and the other identifies as animals, specifically dogs and then they have gang wars. Afterwards they retreat back to the warehouse district and the polyhedron respectively- wait, wait the, the what now? That doesn't make any sense. In fact, a lot of random staircases in this town don't. You know what? This setting has no right to make sense or work together whatsoever, but it does and it all fits right here. Most attempts at world building struggle to balance a couple of different cultures and races for a whole entire world and still not have it look like trash, yet Pat Logic does it with a little village that you can run across in a couple of minutes. It's so unbelievably dense and polished. Already having made the game once obviously helps a little. And whilst we're on the topic of world building, the conlanging, that being the creating of fictional languages, is simply amazing. The step tongue is so bizarre, yet it also feels real. Shabnak, Erdem, Emshin, Oinon, Menku, no one man should have all the power to make such cool sounding words. The choice to throw single ones at you every now and then instead of in full sentences was great. And so was just the general naming of everything. The gut, the maw, the spleen, the marrow, the skinners. A lot of them are named after body parts, which is fitting and sounds cool as hell. You also notice that the visuals are frankly amazing. Don't look at my recording since I can barely run the game and I'm playing with the worst possible settings but trust me, this game looks superb at its best. Everything just looks so clean and smooth as weird as that sounds. The houses have these really sharp edges, I really love the art style. The lighting is also superb. Amazing color palette too, the red of bricks, the grey of stones, the copper red of trees and bushes and their brown branches, the black I can't say yet because it's a spoiler, the ugly almost yellowish green of the grass, the white of bones, I can go on and on and these will be the colors that keep popping up, black, grey, white, red, brown and green, these are the colors of this step town. Now, when it comes to the models of normal NPCs, it is a little immersion breaking to be able to see the same guy like 3 times in one place. They have different hair colors sometimes, but that's as far as it goes, and not even always. Of course, they don't have the best budget and chose to spend it somewhere else, it's not the biggest problem ever, but it's still one. The voice acting is much the same. A lot of thieves, for example, will say the same line again and again. Sometimes there are 3 of them and it goes like this. Get up, get over, stop right, got you. Turn. That's the combat music. 
Speaking of music, the soundtrack, man the soundtrack in this game is great, it's full of such weird tribal chants and it sets the mood very well, while it might be perhaps a little inferior to the original one in catchiness, it's definitely way more grounded in the setting, especially for Barach, as we said, that's how he hears the town. But the original was still one of the most genius OSTs ever made. Some of it is very, very odd, sure, and a part definitely misses the point by a long shot, but not all of it. I can think of songs that would definitely fit right into Pathologic 2. If this randomly ended up in your game's files and played when out in the step, I don't think anyone would question it. How can you let go of Utroba Night? I feel like the town music is what lacks in this game and these old songs could have helped. Also songs like Indoor Main for Shops, and Warehouse Grief for Bad Grief. It's so unique. They did keep the Broken Heart team and simply remixed it, so there's that. Anyway, you eventually go to the hindquarters in order to meet your father. Three men back at the train station attacked you because they thought you were a murderer. As it turns out, someone got killed tonight. As you walk the empty streets, the sun starts to rise and more people come out, some of them attacking you as well. What the hell is going on? You hopefully make your way to the house and, um, yeah, he's he's dead. Izzero Barach, the surgeon, is the one that got murdered tonight, and so did Simon Kine, his dear friend and 157 year old, supposedly immortal true ruler of the town. The father dies on the same day the son arrives. It all makes sense now. Everyone avoids trading with you, people lock their windows and hide children when you approach. You have nowhere to sleep but at your father's house, which definitely has something wrong with it, besides the obviously unsettling thoughts. It really isn't the best place to stay at. Act 1 has barely started, but everyone already hates you. The only choice you have when it comes to buying food is visiting the shady shop in the warehouse district, though it only has so much every day. All you have left afterwards is stealing. You're stuck in a perpetual cycle of more stealing and becoming even more hated for it. This is a little more than the sneak peek of a ruined campaign we saw in the prologue. It isn't disconnected from the real playthrough anymore, you're living it. It's almost as if the game thought, you know what, I don't think you get it. Here, see what really happens when you screw up. It's quite effective, learning from others' mistakes is what smart people do, but nothing teaches you better than experience. But how do I recover from this little maneuver that cost me all my reputation? I get it, I swear, I won't steal. Can I please be out now? Please? No. 
First, take a look at this reputation. Something isn't quite the same. That's right, Pathologic 2 actually opted for each district having an individual reputation bar about you instead of one for the whole town like before. So if you do a lot of bad stuff in, say, the mall, your reputation there lowers and also a little less, though still a bit, in the neighboring districts. It depends on what you do. Stealing is not the same as killing children. Yes, you you can do that. Again, it's a good addition, not the children killing part. Anyway, the first opportunity you might come across to fix this reputation is when you meet your old friend Gregory Philin, also known as Bad Grief. He has kind of become a big thing around here since you last saw him, a supposed criminal mastermind. Kind of ironic in this situation, isn't it? He wants you to help one of his boys who's apparently been stabbed. Take anything he's in need, he adds. Whatever that means. When you track him down, you can perform your first autopsy, and the shiv is there. Well, it's not a shiv, it's actually a lockpick, since in this town only Menku are allowed to cut bodies open, those who know the lines of the body. This too is only for stabbing. It's such a cool detail, really shows how much of a taboo it is, how ingrained people are in this culture, if even murderers are afraid of breaking it. But if you aren't paying much attention, you might take out one of his organs. Oh. This is so easy to mess up, you don't know how the mechanics work, and besides, Bad Grief made the take out anything he doesn't need comment. I mean, it's obvious that he needs these organs, but you might not have given it much thought. Again, you really feel like Borach, stumbling through the town not really knowing what you're doing, what you should or shouldn't. He has to remember it all, and you have to learn it from scratch. On your way out, a Twajinian tells you to loot this house as much as you want, since it's abandoned and other thieves have been here already, you'll just kind of blend in and your reputation won't go down. It makes sense, and it works much the same for the rest of the game. Oh, and you don't actually get anything for doing this quest, not even reputation. What did you think, that saving a criminal would clear your name? Of course not. It was just an organ taking tutorial. You'll be doing that a lot, and it lowers your reputation, alright? Back at the warehouses, you also meet Notkin, the leader of the Soul and a Halves, one of the two kid gangs, that which claims to have animal soul counterparts. He says that a kid named Lika poisoned some of their halves and just ran away, so they give you a leash to hand to him. Apparently, it's supposed to mean something. So you find him and realize that he is the same dog yet you met at the beginning of the game. You likely hand him the leash, not thinking much of it, since it can't really hurt, and then find him back at the fortress. Oh, I guess he's a real soul and a half now, only they get to have leashes after all. And yet, he's speaking rather weirdly. Is he traumatized? If you push Notkin on this, he tells you that Lika took a trip underground and it's why he's like this. What does that mean? It means they threw him down a well. That's the only pit in this town as far as we know. You'll see it later, it's a secret one since it's shunned upon to dig into the ground here. The king believed that all of the earth is actually Mother Bodo, a living creature, and you're literally digging into her flesh by disturbing the earth. I love this quest, and specifically how unclear it is as to what happened at the end. Lika's wearing a mask, so you aren't sure at first whether it's him and whether they killed the original or not, and you kind of still aren't. It's left to interpretation, we can deduce that this is 100% Lika, even when looking at the dialogue, it just sounds like a kid that doesn't know you. Either way, you get a leash of your own for the trouble. Your old friend Lara Rebel will give you some food if you meet up, but only once. She also asks you to check the house when she hears someone walking, and you meet this strange girl. This Clara, also known as the Changeling, is actually one of the three doctors in town other than you and the Bachelor. Yes, together you are the three playable characters in Pathologic 1, though Clara being a part of the doctors is troubling to say the least. She seems like the anti-vax type. As a whole, she isn't really making much sense, so you just leave her alone. Afterwards, your reputation in the flying, chine and backbone go back to neutral. Things are starting to pick up. There is actually a fourth doctor, Stanislav Rubin, or Stach, an old friend of yours and also an apprentice of your dad's. When you go to his house, however, the bachelor is who's there. Meet Daniel Dankowski, who is undoubtedly the biggest prick in the whole town. Well, he did convince Rubin that you might not be your father's murderer, which he seems to believe for some reason, so that's great at the very least. He still has what I believe to be an AI-generated, most punchable face in existence, though. Finally, you can also meet, uh... Boss? Bios? Boyos? Vlad, big Vlad, Vodiswaf Ogimski, he wants to congratulate you for being a good boy, so he clears your reputation in each and every district. They're nice! But if you even talk to Alexander Saborov, on the other hand, he decides that you're the murderer and throws you into a cell immediately to do nothing but sleep until 8pm. Oh. 
Anyhow, this is great. You likely did speak to him, thereby learning that your actions can have severe consequences. But more importantly, that this isn't a game game. You don't need to complete every single thing, that's not what people do and this is a realistic, arguably simulation game. If someone in real life tells you to not speak to Alexander Sabrov because he will literally throw you in prison, you don't speak to Alexander Sabrov. Not very complicated, is it? Just because it's a possible interaction doesn't mean it will be a positive one. These quests in your mind map are simply things you remember people mentioning or asking you to do. People can ask you to do anything. If someone tells you to jump off a bridge, we will jump off a bridge. <laughs> Sorry. But really, inaction is just as much an action as action is action. If someone needs help and you don't do anything, you just did something. By the way, the mind map itself is so damn cool. Besides the plot being a little more understandable in its own compared to the first game, this also helps. It's easy to follow everything and in a way it's simply the developers flexing just how much they can connect seemingly unrelated events with common causes, shared themes and so on. It's incredibly clear what you're supposed to be doing and I never found myself having to google something. The same can be said about Pathlogic 1. Here's another amazing thing about quests. You don't need to run around like a chicken without a head anymore. Going from house to house trying to figure out who has a quest for you just to be hit in the face with an I need some sleep if it's a man or I'm expecting a visitor for a woman. In Pathlogic 2 sometimes you remember stuff people mentioned yourself, like just a slight comment about how someone's doing two days ago. You might meet random people telling you to go to someone or inducing that you ought to check up on someone due to the current situation, maybe they're connected to it somehow. At times you might get a messenger sent for you, I mean a lot of these people that need you are pretty rich. Maybe Maybe even just feel that someone needs you, like with Capella who just happens to have some supernatural powers. The walking is the most divisive thing about bad logic, so this is a great change. But back to getting thrown in prison. It very much shows you that you can't be everywhere, you can't save everyone. That's a tip from the loading screen, it might just be the most useful one I've ever seen for a game. Not only do you not have enough time for every single possible endeavor by design, they intentionally put more than you can do in a day even if you don't struggle with surviving, you sometimes make bad decisions that set you back. Imagine you don't have food but you don't want to spend your last money on it so you rob a house and get beat up and kill people and lower your reputation and get beat up more and now you're searching for food and bandages. On that absolutely hypothetical day, you won't have enough time to do all the daily quests. It's purely your fault. But even if you do everything pretty perfectly, it's still possible to miss stuff. Don't blame yourself in those cases. Sometimes you might not even have time for the theater. Speaking of that, by this point, darkness has likely fallen. The Hruspex recalls that each night the pantomime is played at the theater. You really have nothing to do, so you might as well go there. These plays are weird. All the actors are perfect copies of the characters they portray, their looks, their voices, everything. And the plays themselves most often predict the future, discuss things they shouldn't know about, or straight up breaking the fourth wall. This first one is Mark Immortel telling you, the Haruspex, to not die that much. It causes irreversible harm to the world, he says, but is that true? Yes, and actually dying in Pathlogic 2 as a whole is surreal. Each time it happens, you speak to Mark and he rags on you for dying, tells you you're a bad actor and that dying only brings misfortune to others and you, makes the game harder. This dialogue with him is always great by the way and provides some very unique conversations, but wait, brings misfortune? Hurts the world? Yes, there's a tumor, the giant skeleton thing that looms over the theater, growing each time you fail. Even if you reload, these penalties stay, they are profile wide. I expected the colossal thing to eventually collapse on top of it if I died too much, but it never did. Besides, it didn't stop me from sucking so much either. There's a kid in an adorable rat costume here, by the way, who gives you cool dialogue as the tumor grows. I guess he isn't real, or even the tumor for that matter. Probably. And what do you mean by it makes the game harder? Well, it decreases your maximum health, immunity and hunger up until this much, at 26 deaths, after which it stops deteriorating. This mechanic is simply genius, as it disincentivizes people from making stupid decisions. It doesn't seem that hindering when you're on top of your game and not dying much, and that's because it isn't. A couple deaths here and there aren't the end of the world, but that's not what's gonna be happening. You will very likely reach the 26 deaths point. These plays are also very well voice acted, mostly better than the old ones, I think, though the Haruspex in particular stands out. He might be the best of all the actors when it comes to conveying emotion, with his sighing in between lines and generally less monotone talking. So I'd kindly ask you to do your very best. Work hard, take care of yourself. Where are the other two? The bachelor and the girl? 
I like the emotionless talking of some characters, but I'm not really sure how I feel about it as a whole. The animations don't help much with discerning feelings. The plays are good, but I think the direction they went with the voices could have been better is all. It's nice that it all feels like a play, but honestly, sometimes it's not a very good one. Continuing, the old narrator's beak and talent are still there. They show up a little less often, though focusing on the characters instead is just as good. The visuals are superior too, which is, I mean, pretty important for a play. A lot of thought was put into these shots, and being able to actually realize them with the resources we have today compared to back in 2005 is great. Just look at this. In general, I'd say the theater has been greatly improved. The plays are still mysterious, but not overly cryptic. You can actually reasonably understand what they're talking about this time. That's important, because it's no longer just a pastime, but it also reveals the location of the dead item shop upon exit. The dead item shop is still there if you don't go to the theater, you just don't know where. It's such a nice retreat during the night. As its merchant says, darkness changes the town, makes it show a different face. That face is full of thieves and strange sounds startling as you try and rummage through a trash can. But this shop is a nice contrast. The fellow rag and bone man often asks you interesting questions or just chats with you for a bit. It actually feels even more comforting just because it's during the night. He also sells you very, very useful items for dead ones. Items like used, bloody bandages, broken ampules of morphine, things you don't need. He gives you the best food items and sometimes what is the most valuable item you can acquire in the game. I won't spoil it though. Otherwise, kids go home during the night and, as we said, thieves come out. They are who you'll be fighting with most of the time, so we might as well cover the combat. Fighting is not something you're supposed to do in Pathologic, at least in most situations. Getting jumped by three guys, or even two at times, is not worth it. If it's with knives, even a one-on-one -on -one is about who strikes first. There is no real skill, there is no real way to defend yourself from someone with a knife. That's how real life works. You shouldn't get into a knife fight unless you want to be severely injured and have a good chance at death. Here's a reality check. This is not real. This is complete fiction. Unless you have a gun, the only thing you can do is run, and thieves do the same thing when their health gets too low. Even if you have a gun, it's painfully and hilariously realistic, and they can jump frequently as their durability lowers. The game doesn't have interesting and complex fighting mechanics when it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat either, because most people kind of suck at that, and Artemy does too. You aren't playing an MMA dude, you're a doctor. Pathologic 1 is way more clunky, yet ironically easier than 2. Bandits were something you actually sought out, since it was such a simple way of getting rich. That's because most of them in fact had a good amount of money to buy some food with, which is not the case in 2. They barely have any coins here, it's why they're bandits. I was actually very disappointed on day 4 in Pathologic 1 as the hero specs when the big difficulty spike came and my reputation dropped close to zero, so I just avoided people for the remaining 10 hours of my day or so and then killed like 6 bandits easily and got back on track. Just like that. Now in 2, when you're running away, they can even grab you and spin your camera around. Oh, and at the end of each day, dropped items and corpses despawn, even though you might have been about to loot them. This is likely to prevent you from just dropping items and being able to have storage anywhere, or using corpses as storages instead of doing it the intended way in your home's cupboard. Ooh, spoiler, is he gonna have a cupboard? But we can have a better solution than that, simply making items despawn on a timer instead of choosing a specific point for each day. Make them last 12 in-game hours, or make it 24, whatever you want. This is just better by itself since you can impose a certain time. As it stands right now, it can either be 15 minutes if you drop something at 7.15, or 24 hours if you do it 15 minutes later. The spawning really is annoying, and it doesn't make any sense. Why do these items disappear before my eyes? My solution answers that. Just make a character tell you that people will steal your stuff if you leave them lying on the ground. It's an in-game world thing. Abandoned houses could work much the same way, people steal from there too. In the homes of regular NPCs, let's just say they take the items and hide them so you cannot go back and demand that they be returned because you simply forgot them there. I mean, people in this town are that desperate. Maybe not that much now, but definitely in a bit, you'll see. When it comes to these first days, I really have no better solution, but the developers don't explain it either. 
As we said, 730 marks the official start of the next day, and this one in particular also the start of Act 2. Each act is what you might call a different section of the story. Every other one lasts for multiple days, whilst the first one was a simple introduction to the town, reuniting with everyone, making sense of the layout, shops and so on after getting your reputation back. This means you'll be able to hold on to more quests from now on too. You also get access to the lair, a building near the factories where your dad used to do his work. You can sleep, save, get some water before it runs out, upgrade your inventory, store items and repair equipment. About that last one, it's once again realistic. The more you damage the item, the more it takes to repair it. For a scalpel, 70% to 100 takes a single grindstone, of which you can find a lot of, it's very easy. But from 35 to 70 it also takes a chisel, and 0 to 35 adds an additional razor. It's cheaper to just keep it in pristine condition at all times, obviously. It also deals more damage anyway. Continuing, finally you can brew tinctures and some other stuff down the line. You can find a weird kid pacing around the grey stones in the cemetery, she'll teach you how to pick herbs. And the herbs are actually highlighted at night, which is understandable. In one you couldn't really make out what was an herb and what wasn't, you just have to run around clicking on grass. That was realistic, but perhaps the glowing is an in-world thing too. The herbs can actually be heard during the day, so that's even better. It still preserves that feeling of being a mystical step gatherer without making it all incredibly frustrating at times too. Anyway, the kid's name is Murky, she's one of the 8 children on a list your father wrote, which you are given by Aspity at his funeral. You aren't really told anything about it, the names are Sticky, Capella, Murky, Notkin, Han, Grace, Tayataichik and Unfamiliar Step Sigil. Don't worry about that last one. You realize that Isidore spent time with these children and taught them stuff. They claim he wanted to change the town and needed their help, but you aren't explained any more than that. However, it makes sense, all of them seem to be children of high status or extraordinary ability. Murky, a kid that can speak to the earth, Sticky, an orphan who knows the town and its secrets better than anyone else, your father also taught him how to brew tinctures, Notkin, the leader of the Saw in the House, Han or Caspar Kain, the leader of the Dockheads and king of the mysterious Polyhedron, also a Kain after all, yes that is how you pronounce it because it's Maria Kaina. Continuing, Grace, a girl that can speak with the dead, Taya Taichik, daughter of the deceased Overseer Taichik, which makes her the leader of the Kin of the Termitary, and Capella, arguably the most important one. She has clairvoyant powers, is the leader of the town's children, and the daughter of Big Vlad, who is in turn the leader of the town's industry and economy. About the powers, that makes her an aspiring mistress. The mistresses in this town were, well, women from important families that had clairvoyance powers and helped keep order. They kept the balance. The Kinds had the dark mistress. Mistress Nina, the Ogimskis, the bright one Victoria, and I guess the suburb also a few decentrates with Katarina. Okay, she's actually the Earth Mistress, though she's still in the center. Katarina is the only mistress that remains from the tree, so I guess we need Capella after all to be the bright one. Maria Kaina, on the other hand, is said to inherit the dark title, she has visions too. But let's go back to the brewing. A tincture is made when you combine two different herbs and one bottle of water. No recipes are given to you at any point in the game for making the tinctures, but there is a huge poster on the wall that hints at what you need. Basically, there are three primary herbs, black, brown and blood twire, and three special herbs, white whip, ashen swish and swavery. There are also three normal tinctures and three powerful tinctures, yas, blood plus brown, mandrel, blood plus black, and Zyur, black plus brown. Also, Yas plus for white whip and any herb besides Ash and Swish, Mandrel plus for Swavery and whatever else besides white whip, and Zyur plus for Ash and Swish and anything except Swavery. The plus tinctures are more effective, obviously, and also turn the penalties on normal tinctures into positives. For example, Yas increases hunger, whilst Yas plus reduces it. Mandrel does so with exhaustion and Zyur with thirst. They all also increase immunity, I don't know what that's about though. The night after day 2, the theater has you, the bachelor and the changeling discussing medicine, for some reason. Local medicine, established science and Clara's imaginary powers that cure cancer or a tumor or something like that, as she casually says. While you are discussing this, you don't know yet, but as you try and get around town, you realize that some districts have been infected. The town is panicking, people are getting sick left and right, some are gathering outside important people's homes, it's even worse than the day after your father's death. You are to lower one of Notkin's boys' infection, lest he perish soon. That doesn't fix the problem though, still if you don't do it, Aspity will have to instead and end up dying. In order to help the poor kid, you need to diagnose him first. That's where the cool part of tinctures comes in. There are three colors and they all correspond to one of the layers of the human body, bones, nerves or blood. 
In order to find out where the infection is, you ought to keep giving him tinctures. There are seven possible symptoms that can appear whenever you administer a tincture, and most will help. Normal tinctures reveal one symptom, whilst plus tinctures reveal two. The symptoms are, firstly, the ambiguous fever symptom, which says nothing, it can apply to any layer, then the three symptoms relating to the neighboring layers, and the three according to each layer specifically. You need to either get the specific symptom or the two neighboring symptoms, which is just as good. Each time you use a tincture, the patient's pain will increase, and if it maxes out, you cannot administer any more. You can lower it with a painkiller, which may be bought or brewed by combining a tincture and an organ. After diagnosis, you ought to administer an antibiotic of the correct color. This can again be found in stores or homemade by combining a tincture with an infected organ. This isn't the most complex or innovative system in the world, but I like it for what it is. At 6 p.m. the town's bell will toll and every single person on the streets will disappear, aside from the tragedians that wait behind every corner, pointing you to a single location, the town hall. Most of the important adults have gathered there and they all agree on the obvious fact. There is a plague, and it's probably the sand plague, the one that almost wiped out the whole town five years ago. Only one thing's different this time. Your father isn't here to save everyone. It's all on you, Dankowski and Rubin. There will be a fund, there will be a headquarters, intrigue, sleepless nights. It kind of feels anticlimactic, but only because you already know about it. It isn't really supposed to be a plot twist. The prologue showed people dying of the plague, you died of the plague in the dream sequence, you have a literal immunity bar, the Steam page tells you the game's about a deadly outbreak, the executives look like plague doctors, and so on. It's more like, alright, let's get this show on the road, finally. In the first game, on the other hand, it felt like they glossed over it, as if it wasn't a big deal or you missed the important conversation where it was revealed and you're only getting the later dialogue when everybody's already made sense of the situation. Either way, if you aren't yet hooked, I hope this does it for you. Now that you know all about the plague, we can have some more gameplay talk. A big positive change that was brought on by 2 is a bigger emphasis on survival mechanics, as we said. Originally, you had to eat, sleep, manage your health and your immunity if you don't want to get sick. In 2, you also have stamina, which helps with realism and limiting you spamming and running away in combat. This stamina bar is tied to thirst. As you use stamina again and again, your maximum becomes smaller until you drink enough water. It makes sense. Immunity employs a similar mechanic. When you get infected, the infection becomes a part of the immunity bar. The more immunity you have, the slower the infection grows. The more infection you have, the less space you have for immunity. In fact, all the stats play with each other a lot. You're infected, so you take pills to lower it, but it lowers your health too. You take some morphine to heal, but you have to sleep for it to work. You do so, but now you need to eat. You find some food, but it increases your thirst. You drink water, which increases exhaustion, if only but a little. Still, after some time, you will get tired again. You eat raw coffee beans, but it hurts your health. You might need to steal for food, but that affects reputation. You may need to hunt thieves for lockpicks and money, but that risks your health. You need bandages, but they cost money. And that takes time to fix. I can go on forever, but you get the idea. Those last two things weren't actual meters, but they all still play into each other. It's not just survival, it's everything. It's designed so, so well. These are all of the same category in a way. Health, immunity, infection, exhaustion, hunger, stamina, thirst, reputation, time, equipment, durability, items, inventory space. These are all resources. It's all about juggling them and you can't always have everything be perfect. Sometimes you gotta choose the lesser evil. Path Logic 2 is one of the only games ever that the idea of holding resources and not using every advantage you have never even popped into my head. That's like not even conceivable here. The game is designed to make you feel as if you're barely, just barely getting by and most of the time you are. Although it's always so satisfying when you get that slight window where you have flawless everything. Then you get infected and it's all a slippery slope into a brick wall once again. And we can speak more about the mechanics as a whole. A simpler addition is items taking up more space than others do. Playing inventory Tetris is always fun and also realism. Duh. Little additions like that pile up to make the game way better. Look at Pathologic 1, it's a very simple game, almost in an unfinished kind of way. Next, there is actually lockpicking now, you don't just stick it in there and wiggle it around, uh... Like it's just a key and it opens the door easily. It's a cool little mini game. not that Artemy would actually know how to pick a lock, but oh well. It also doesn't have anything to do with how you pick a lock in reality, like they didn't even try to make it realistic, so that sucks. Most games aren't that great either, but even those like Oblivion where you can actually see the pins at least have the right idea in mind. Splinter Cell gets it best as far as I know. Either way, it's better to at least try. 
about stealing, Bad Logic 1 didn't hurt your reputation for it unless they saw you do it, which made things way too easy at times. And they did see you enter the house, so if something disappears, it's only expected that rumors of you being a thief spread. You kind of stick out, being one of the few doctors in town. In Bad Logic 2, it always lowers your reputation, whether they let you enter or you sneaked in. If possible, the game should have had some mechanic wherein if you lockpicked your way inside and didn't get seen, you should be able to steal without repercussions. And obviously, if they did see a man that shouldn't be in their house, they would confront you immediately. I never really get why NPCs in games don't react to that type of stuff. Just think of how freaked out you'd be if a random person entered your house while you were chilling and watching TV or something. Anyway, making it like that would create a high risk, high reward type of situation. Next, let's talk a little about difficulty. This is the best way I can think of when it comes to explaining the difference between these two games. In Bad Logic 2, you're tempted to look up a guide because you keep dying and don't know how to survive. In Bad Logic 1, it's because the game sometimes fails to make it clear what you're supposed to do. My biggest kerfuffles ever were in Pat Logic 2. In 1, it's incredibly easy to just kill bandits and get rich as hell if you wanted to. 2 is hard, but 1, honestly, not that much. It's hard to play Pat Logic 1 for a long period of time because it gets boring, whereas in 2, it's because it's stressful. More on difficulty, Pat Logic 2 also has a difficulty slider. Yes, that's how it's done. No painstaking balance issues that postpone the game. No need to have too many difficulties to make sure every player can beat it. Just simple accessibility. The game wants you to be on a certain level of frustration, to be almost unbearable, but that's different for everyone. Sure, the intended difficulty is the safest bet, and I would suggest the majority of people go with it at first, but still. I imagine if my grandma wanted to play the game, that point would be on a way lower difficulty for her. But that wouldn't change the game. It's the same experience of despair whilst actually being able to beat that logic. It's sad we have no limited life difficulty though. Finally, by this point you've probably noticed that you can in fact save. However, it's different than before. Excluding some very specific points of the story, you can only save on the clocks in imported NPCs' houses. This is great. The game itself determines how often you should visit these NPCs, which means it regulates how often you should save. This is obviously ignoring the fact that you can enter a house at any time and still save, but that takes time, and as little as it may be, your time remains incredibly valuable. Meanwhile, in Path Logic 1, you could quick save at any place and at any time. About to approach a burglar? Save. About to enter an infected house? Save. About to do literally anything that could pose any threat? Save. There are no real consequences when it comes to death in Path Logic 1. But now there are. Do you remember the death mechanic? Yes, now you are even more disincentivized to not do stupid stuff since you'll be losing your time from the saves. Yes, calling that a consequence might seem absurd to some, but it's very much true. You're more likely to be careful for bandits if they could set you back 15 minutes. In Pat Logic 1, I can keep on trying something like killing one again and again, over and over until I get it right. But in 2, it would drive me insane. That is, if the bandit would even be there, which he wouldn't. That's another genius addition. Every time you walk out, even if it's from the same save, the NPCs will be different. The game is weirdly randomized like that, like a roguelike, which also helps in cases where you do keep dying to something over and over. When it comes to the plague, it's much the same. I can load the save if I get it, but it's still 15 minutes. However, I would argue that you shouldn't save scum at all. It's good that the plague sets you back if you do decide to save scum, but that is not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to live with it. It really isn't a matter of debate. Which are you more scared of? A plague cloud that will set you back 15 minutes, or a plague cloud that will attach a metal ball to your foot in the form of infection, dragging you back throughout the whole playthrough and takes one of your rare schmauders to cure it. That's the most valuable item in the game that I talked about by the way. It's a soup of dangerous pills that eradicates the plague from your body no better than chopping off your arm fixes a broken wrist. Only one kid NPC can trade for it, very rarely, and acquiring it in other ways is just as hard and rare. Or what about making the decision of walking through two or three infected districts in a row, expecting that simply breathing the air for too long will give it a plague, which does happen, and then set you back 15 minutes, versus once again having to live with it. You would obviously be way more considerate and paranoid in the second instances here. Safe scumming just ruins the whole game's point, since there are no stakes to anything. Also, sure, losing time can be an annoying thing in other instances, but I think it very much does more good than bad. 
Infection is fun, it's one of the most important mechanics in the game and it's very unfortunate that it's so easy to justify safe scum in it. That wasn't my fault, that was unfair and such. Just take this from me, I very very much regret not actually doing this for the first two thirds of my playthrough and instead killing myself sometimes when I got the plague. Not every time, I lived with it when Clara gave it to me when I got infected in the house of the dead and generally each time it felt like it was my fault, each time it wasn't just me bumping into a cloud when going going through a door while checking the time on my phone or something. I'm saying feel because in those times it was my fault. If you're really careful about getting the plague it will not happen in those instances. I kind of just didn't think about it and locked it away in the box in my brain and threw away the key and kept loading saves inconsiderately. Oh and also, saves don't overwrite each other like quick saves did in Pathologic 1 on every third save. If you wanted old saves there you had to manually save and I, I, I hate manually saving, Jesus. In short, the Ludo narrative of Pathologic 2 is simply perfect, that being the relation between narrative and gameplay, whether they work together well. Ludo narrative dissonance is applicable to games in which they contradict. Now, it's a rather controversial term and some are against it, but I don't think it needs to be that complicated. No one is saying that you ought to never put characters in uncomfortable situations, situations which contradict their usual nature. That's just a part of storytelling. Ludo narrative dissonance is more suited for when the hero is portrayed as this righteous warrior that has a good cause and wants to save people, but the moment you start playing you go on killing random people for items. It can be used to tell stories in a subtle way, like, I don't know, insinuating that the main character doesn't see these people as important or something, but it has to be intentional rather than hypocritical. Look at something like my beloved Skyrim. I really love that game, I do, but just how much are you truly in a hurry to save the world if you keep getting presented with and encouraged to do hundreds of side quests with no repercussions? But what about Witcher 3? Why am I so pressure to go save Siri and catch the vampire into sun when I have Gwen to play. For serious though, probably the most infuriating case, when a character shrugs off hundreds of bullets just to be rendered disabled by one shot in a cutscene. Many developers overlook these flaws and just look at them as a necessary evil in video games. A flaw, but this doesn't have to be one. All you need is creative writing and design. But what about Pathologic 2? Here you are not ever presented as a perfect hero or even a hero at all. You are someone that steals from people's houses and might even kill one for your own survival because you are possibly more vital in the big picture than them as a doctor. Most often the narrative and the gameplay of the game blend together. I am not only choosing something in a quest through dialogue, I am also choosing whether to risk my life to save a civilian from a thug or give away my medication for someone else or steal so I can survive and so on. Rarely do you think to make Make the distinction between these two aspects. Still, in a way, most of the moral choices you make are through gameplay rather than narrative. They are not scripted ones. Let's continue with day four. That night is the third theater, and it's basically Beak and Talon whining about the plague. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the outbreak. The theater is officially disbanded, as well as other conveniences. Running water, access to your own children, who never leave their beloved polyhedron anyway, sewage, friendly smiles on the street, any respect for the institution of marriage, food, etc, etc. As soon as the sun rises, however, the theater remains open as it has been turned into a hospital. You will be working here every single day with your colleagues and the orderlies. The latter have all donned the executor outfits since they come in rather handy. You have to do this work each day if you want to keep receiving food and money from the fund. About that, there is a bar that fills up the more antibiotics you prescribe to sick people, the more babies you save, more about that later, and in general, the more good you do. If you max it out, you get thousands of coins, medicine, tons of food and so on. You get nothing if you ignore the hospital work though. Today's quest is giving painkillers to sick people so that death isn't as painful. Yeah, this really isn't the best doctor's work, but it's not about that, it's about doing as much as you can. Everything else relating to the cure, the panacea you're hoping to somehow brew using your father's techniques and lab, you have to do on your own. From now on, districts will either remain normal, become infected or burned after the plague in them has been eradicated with fire. Infected districts have the sand plague, obviously, whilst burned districts have looters, even during the day. When looting houses in the latter, you usually encounter a looter and find some pretty good loot. The infected ones have better loot, though the plague in the houses is just too dangerous. That had more loot than an EA game. 
Lara will also ask you to find her water bells because she's planning to establish a shelter for the poor people in town. Nice cause, but you can't find any good ones that the guards are willing to give up. Only murky ones, possibly contaminated. If you do take them to her, the district becomes infected the following day. Again, a great example of what we discussed earlier about finishing quests for the sake of finishing quests. With the plague in full effect, parents will be dying or perhaps even abandoning their babies. You may choose to rescue them from the infected houses if you wish. You are able to hear them crying from very far away. And it might be the most ear-splitting and annoying sound I've ever heard. The audio mixing is so bad that I had to turn down my volume each time there was a baby. I don't know if this was intentional or not, but honestly, all it did was make me never go into one of those houses. Sure, I was never going to originally since it's more trouble with the chance of infection than what it's worth with the extra fun rewards, but now I'm never going to go in there no matter what. A little after the start of day 4 begins act 3. The previous one was seemingly an introduction to the plague and also everything related to it. The hospital, how to pick herbs in order to make medicinal tinctures and the place and tools you need so you can brew them. At 3.30pm, young Vlad will send a messenger for you and invite you to show you his... hoe. What the hell man, people can dig holes here, what are you crazy? Anyway, he ignores that and instead asks for your judgement on whether these two kin claiming the sand plague doesn't affect them is true or not. You can't really tell, but they seem honest. If you go check up on Notkin, you realize that Sol and the house have taken up to the completely safe pastime of walking around infected districts every day and mapping which are infected, burned or safe. You can trade with them for a copy of the map every single day. You can also mark it on your own, but that requires walking around the town yourself. It's great that you can actually do it, since in Pathlogic 1 you literally had to remember, and that was extra hard since there was no way to see the district's names. Sometimes you'd even get told to go to one with no extra context. At the end of day 4, this happens. You will be rolling for sickness every single day from now on, for every character that resides within an infected district. It's still random, but cannot be changed if you reload the save or die, which is very good. You can give them immunity boosters to decrease the probability, sure, but there's always a pretty good chance that they'll catch it. It's not a vaccine, it's a pill. And what happens if they do get it? Well, here's another great change. It's not only you dying that is different in this remake, characters can now die as well. They will be gone forever. How? If they get sick, they now roll for death. It works exactly the same way, but with antibiotics instead of immunity boosters. In Pathlogic 1, all that really happened when your brown got sick was you just couldn't talk to them, and if you didn't cure the ones associated with each of the three playable characters, you couldn't choose that character's ideal ending. There were also two secret encounters gated behind curing two-thirds and every single one of the bound respectively. There is way more weight to your actions now, here's even more, they can also die because of your choices. I only remember it happening once in the first game's Specs route, yet here it's actually 6 possible deaths in a playthrough. If you don't do a quest in the first game, people get sick and you can't talk to them. If you don't do quests in Pathlogic 2, people sometimes die. Like we already mentioned, whole districts can also get infected, both if you do something bad that you might even think is good, and not do anything at all by ignoring quests. On the preceding night, the theater is once again Beak and Talon, this time praising your dad and telling you how much you suck and can't do anything. Oh, how his son tries to sew it back together. Maybe he'll succeed. And with pretty stitches. You're kidding. People like him only care about themselves. They can't connect things. They certainly can't sew anything. There he is. Look. He came to watch. Watch you foam at the mouth. So, day 5. The burned districts become more dangerous, with these guys throwing molotovs at anything and everything that's infected, including you. Here's something interesting. Fire actually lowers your infection. Now, it won't cure the plague, and it can kill you in less than a second, but it really helps more than it hurts. Just kidding, it can cure the plague, if you somehow manage to survive it. This might just be the coolest mechanic in the whole game. Still, you might be better off going around some of these districts at times to avoid them, specifically the infected ones. That's even more walking. I'm sure I've given you enough time up until now to notice just how much of it there is. You walk a lot. 
And sadly, that becomes a problem when you also realize just how annoying the layout of the town is. In the old path logic, it was purposely built to be confusing. It seemed that coming across a dead end literally all the time was almost inescapable, but it still wasn't that bad since everything was recognizable. It doesn't even have to be an important location like an NPC's house, but rather something like a damn set of stairs next to a grocery shop. For some reason, this whole layout was memorable, I can imagine it very well. Not in Path Logic 2. Here, a lot of stuff just looks the same. Not a lot of elevation, it's all just straight streets. This isn't bad by itself, but when trying to get somewhere fast, it makes me open the map literally every 3 seconds to make sure I didn't walk past the street I needed to turn at, or arrive at a dead end, or something like that. You could argue for a minimap, which would solve the issue, but it takes away from the realism. I think the real problem here simply lies in the town's layout. Awkward to navigate town should mean, for example, lacking an opening in a fence, which makes you walk around it and waste 30 minutes. It shouldn't mean, I have have no idea where I am in a game where you spend a lot of time walking from one place to another. I wish I shouldn't have to say this, but they almost made the walking, the most divisive thing about the game, worse. Luckily, they made up for it in a lot of other ways. It's not so bland anymore, like a lot of the gameplay used to be in fact. It was just hold W until you get there and you had no other options. Now you can sprint, you can fast travel, you talk with a lot more people along the way, there is a lot of random dialogue with strangers. In Pathlogic 1, I would sometimes just listen to a podcast to put on a video or something. Thing. Otherwise, I would have gone completely insane. I know this because I didn't do it the first time and it really soured my experience. Unless you have a lot to think about, and I'm talking hours upon hours upon hours, you'll be bored too. I never really had that in the remake. Both of the games are great for thinking though every now and then. It's better than just thinking, if that makes any sense. It's like how thinking while washing dishes, or thinking while cleaning, or thinking while working out are better than just thinking. You're actually doing something. Not that thinking is a waste of time, but it's always better to multitask as much as possible as long as it doesn't take away from any of the separate experiences. I don't know about you, but anyone that can sit down and just listen to a podcast or talk on Discord without doing anything else is a complete psychopath to me. Just play Minecraft or something like a normal person. Or I guess Pathlogic 1. Okay, day 6. The play that night is absolutely hilarious. All three of the characters are just exaggerated versions of themselves. It's like the actors just read two sentences describing them and got to work. I don't believe you. And I don't like you. Actually, that's too mild a statement. I feel an innate resentment towards you. Ah, oh, it's... well, <laughs> alright then. Most people love me. I don't like you either, girl of fate. But not just you, I'm not sure I know how to love. Enough! This won't do. It won't do at all. For some time now, you've had the quest of brewing together tinctures and various organs to possibly create a cure or something. You have to test 3 before realizing it's all pointless and give up, after which you go to sleep and get a vision telling you to go to Shechen, the steppe village in the far southeast part of the map. There you find a red puddle and are able to get two bottles of living blood. If you brew it together with a tincture, you get a panacea. It cures the plague completely, with no detriment to your health. This is huge progress. Now, you don't know where to get more, but at least you know that it actually exists. You need to test this panacea to make sure it works before the end of the day, or Rubin will die from working himself to death. I definitely didn't forget to make the obviously useless organ tinctures and thus didn't get the dream and had Rubin die, that would be very stupid of me. Also, hitherto, Murky has been bringing up a supposed friend that she has, who you, for one reason or another, cannot meet. Now you can. Her friend finally allowed it, at Crowstone, after 10pm. That's the plan, and to be honest, I was pretty excited to see what it was gonna turn out to be. Obviously some plot twist or else she wouldn't have been dancing around it for so long. Or maybe it's nothing at all. So you go to the meet and there is no one there. Of course, an imaginary friend. You go along with it anyway and stand behind the rocks. Perhaps then she'll show up. Oh, hey changeling, wait a second. Oh no, it's the plague? She has the plague and that's what's talking to her? This is such a cool twist. Also, for once, the changeling is actually the one that makes sense. She tells you the plague isn't literally talking to her, it's just a hallucination. And you can't reason with the plague or confront it. You need to find a cure. Sometimes it almost feels as if there are two changelings with different personalities. Anyway, you go back to tell Murky and what? Um, okay, I guess there's two of them. 
Now you can either simply leave, supposedly leaving Murky in the face of danger, or let the changeling literally give you the plague, which somehow protects her. Was that a miracle, or is she simply a carrier? Well, if you don't do it, Murky does actually die, so work that one out yourself. The play on the night of day 6 is a menacing woman clad in black, sentencing local thieves that have been caught. I see. Northern gold mines. Ten years. The ruthless individual is the Inquisitor, Aglaya Lilich. That's how it's in Russian, that's how I'm pronouncing it. Cry about it. This marks the end of Act 3, the one that started the research into curing the plague, the sleepless nights, the testing, perhaps even Rubin's death if you failed like me. But Act 4 has started, there's no more time to waste. The days that are already over are piling up and the future ones are decreasing, your progress possibly going nowhere. Her arrival can be seen as both fortunate and one extra thing you have to worry about. On one hand, you now have one more person to aid you in your cause of fixing the town, to provide their outlook, their ideas, their time, but you also have one more person to bargain with. She has full power to do anything she wishes and the powers that be have sent her to fix the town by any means necessary. If not, well... When you meet her, it's weird. Everyone at the entrance to the cathedral tells you she can break people and how it's her job, but she honestly doesn't seem that intimidating. There is something about her vacant stare, however, it's just right out of your vision whilst you're reading the text. It's pretty unnerving to be honest. The first game did that two at times, though it was for other reasons. Because of Aglaya, from now on stores will be exchanging food for food stamps and food stamps only. Whilst the shady shop and the broken heart do remain the same, that's only so much food. Otherwise, you might have to steal again. The daily stamps can barely get you something like a bottle of milk unless you're staying on top of your fund game. In other words, Pat Logic continues to push you more and more onto becoming an asshole. Today, you may also enter the Termitary for the first time, and what the hell happened here? Now that is some relaxing ambience. You get to meet Taya Tai Chik and the king outside her chamber will ask you to bring them Vlad Ogensky for he locked them up here, letting the play consume them. Your options are, firstly, tell young Vlad who's the one that actually did it and make him go, causing him to die. Secondly, tell big Vlad who will decline at first but after you speak with young Vlad again will agree to take the blame. And thirdly, tell no one, causing them both to go and both to die. But you can also speak to Big Vlad, then the Changeling and then to Big Vlad again, causing neither to go and neither to die. Sleeping on Night 7 reveals a surprising, but a welcome conversation in your dream, the previous intro to Pet Logic 1, a certified hood classic. It's the big tree discussing their different approaches to fixing the seemingly impossible to fix problem of the plague. The point of view you have on it is so cool, and the lighting in particular is just phenomenal. Of course, the dialogue itself never fails to disappoint either. Everything that limits us exists only in the mind. Imperare sibi maximum imperium est. You're talking past each other. Ah, everyone does. I can perform miracles. Just let me. Let me go. Stop playing against me, both of you. The pantomime, on the other hand, shows even more death sentences. Once again, the character, in this case Aglaius, is very exaggerated, but she also brings up an interesting point about how every form of crime is some kind of betrayal. And I guess you could make that argument. Every serious crime is a betrayal of the trust of your fellow man. We put trust into the social contract because it's all we can do. I expect that you don't beat up, rob and kill me as long as I don't do the same to you. It's a mutual agreement and if you break that, it's the worst betrayal one can do. There are no other crimes. There's no such thing as evil, murder, torture, or violent abuse. The only real crime is betraying someone who trusted you. If and when you speak with a random person on day 8, they claim they finally understand time and that it's actually created at the cathedral, whatever that means. Furthermore, they'll levy their concerns about the Inquisitor messing with it since it's been feeling off ever since she moved in and... It's true. From now on, 10 in-game minutes are actually 27 seconds instead of 40. You can track it yourself if you wanna check. It's so genius, a lot of people might not actually notice it's for real and instead just think everything is slipping away from their control for no apparent reason. The cathedral was 
was built by the kinds and they have quite the interesting relationship with time, they are obsessed with it and even know how to manipulate it. Here is a cool fact, the bachelor came to town for his mission of defeating death in order to meet Simon who is rumored to be 147 years old, and yet his twin brother Georgi doesn't seem to be, or else the Neil would have simply spoken to him. The cathedral apparently distributes time to all the people's homes at their clocks, which happen to be quite magical since they allow you to save, perhaps they just allow you to mess with time too. Their polyhedron also seems to only harbor young people. Speaking of that, today you can ascend if you wish, as you slowly climb it you eventually look up and yes, those are the lines indeed, the connections of the world. By the way, there isn't actually anything here that you can loot or do, but I really think this is enough. I've been skipping over the hospital quests since the start, since most of them are simple, boring tasks such as extract the organs or administer antibiotics or find the living person amongst the piles of dead bodies. You know, the usual stuff. But today's quest is a little different and it once again brings up the topic of why do we have quests, or rather why are they the way they are? Why so video gamey? Hear me out, this is what happens. These two executors tell you to wait here for an hour and try to avoid infection. That's it, there are no twists, so you do exactly that and they don't show up. Shocker, you mark down in your mind map that it's probably a ruse, you hopefully didn't get sick and finally exit to continue your business. Except they weren't, if you wait an extra 15 minutes they actually do show up, they were just late. This sounds so stupid but I truly feel like I've been brainwashed to believe almost anything that a quest log says, so much so that I can't possibly fathom these guys being 15 minutes late if it says it will be 1 hour. I would expect it to say, oh I should wait more or it's simply barring me from exiting altogether. We don't always trust other characters and sometimes not even ourselves, but the quest log always seems worthy of it no matter what, for some reason. Even though it's other characters that gave the quests and us that wrote them down, literally. Again, it's like you're playing a game instead of experiencing a realistic story in a video game format. The play at midnight is... um... what? Oh, I guess the army is here now as well, as if you didn't have enough problems to worry about already. Weirdly enough, the actual arrival is a little before sunrise. Interesting. Their mission seems to be the same as the Inquisitions, though you could say they have more resources. Aglaia however claims they plan to level the town. That's not quite right, they say they'll do it only if there's no other solution. So there's that motivation you've been lacking for the past 9 days. Oh, and you also don't work at the hospital anymore, you're fired. Soon thereafter, General Block disappears and his whereabouts remain unknown for most of the outbreak. A good amount of his men actually lose faith in him and instead side with Captain Longin. What proceeds might just be the hardest part of the game. Finding food genuinely felt impossible. No hospital means no fun, which means no food from there or even extra food stamps. Food stamps in and of themselves being used pretty much means no food. And General Block decides to evacuate all the kids from town before disappearing himself so there's no trading with them. You also can't really afford sleep since you can barely find enough food if all you're doing is actively looking for it as it is. And if you have the plague on top of that, it's a total nightmare. I had to resort to actually letting the thieves kill the soldiers without intervening so I could get their food. It's literally one step before actually killing them yourself. The game never makes you do that to survive, but it nevertheless gets as close as it can. Still, you better get to work. Finally, Oyun returns and tells you that you are allowed to enter the abattoir if you wish. Immediately, you get greeted by a worm presenting you with a fresh fountain of mysterious jungle juice. You take out a comically large spoon and refresh yourself. It completely eliminates your penalties from dying and also heals positive meters and reduces negative ones. Now, this might seem like a nitpick to some, but the following section confused the hell out of me. The game really really strongly incentivize you to sneak around the whole area without conflict. The first time you ran in, you likely got spotted by the giant worm you didn't see in the darkness and then got obliterated by it. Yeah, they're really strong and have a ton of HP. But then you notice that he patrols around the giant connected stalagmite and stalactite, or it might just be a rock, I don't know. And he patrols pretty slowly, for that matter. Walking behind him and getting through is very easy. In fact, doing so with all 5 worms you come across is easy, I tested all of them. You can go through this whole section and exit the abattoir without initiating combat. 
That's weird, because if you kill one you get an empty bottle with which to take the abattoir blood back with you. I mean, it's not clear why they attack you, with how odd Oyun is, it wouldn't be surprising if he just didn't tell them and so they think you're an intruder. The game doesn't really encourage you to kill them, just because they're willing to attack you doesn't mean they deserve to get killed. People do the same if they see you stealing from their house, and in this instance it's precious abattoir blood we're talking about. You need it, at least one bottle to make a single panacea, to see if it works, perhaps another one to present as proof and some more for reasons you'll see later. I just don't see why you'd not only allow but in a way push players to sneak by. This section kind of feels like the road to get into that final moment where the secret actually gets revealed, and not the secret itself. Now, you could say the sneaking is just so you could sneak attack them, but that can be done easily without letting you skip them. For example, make one sit on a rock facing the path forward. You may be able to sneak behind, but not past him. I speak logic and think of something better, I'm sure. Now, this might be seen as gamifying the game too, something I argued against earlier, but I never said doing so is always bad. Just because I'm for reminding the player as little as possible that it's a game, doesn't mean I'm also for not treating it like a game at all. We make the tutorials be an in-world thing, so it's immersive, sure, but we still have them, even though the real world doesn't. Because it is still a game after all. On a better note, everything else here is pretty cool. You see some merbrides dancing with uh, the plague? You also meet one that's a little familiar, I actually haven't told you about her yet, but she's been walking up to you throughout the whole game and telling you those weird things about how you've met before, and one day you'll have to do something important. I guess that's today. Well, that was something. I love this moment, it's unnerving, but also shows just how integrated these people are into this insane culture, whilst otherwise speaking and acting not that outlandish. Like, you wouldn't really expect this person to make you cut her open, it's like you got dragged into some nuts code by a normal girl you met at a bar. Anyway, inside her body is a spindle. You then arrive in front of a giant hall and showcase your knowledge of connections by combining random items to make a living heart, as one does. It goes on to reveal to you exactly how the sand pest works. It doesn't kill only humans, it kills those who live like humans. That's why the worms who work at the termitary are affected by two, yet the herbrides are not. Those who are one with Mother Earth are not hurt by her. This isn't a real heart, I don't think. It seems like you're just literally making connections inside your head and figuring out how it all works after observing the inside of the abattoir. Or you might literally be talking to a heart. It's ambiguous, like in most of the game. As you jump into the hole, however, you find something even more unnerving. Where a bull's blood has been poured for thousands of years, there lies a living creature. This is the Udura. Whatever. The eighth name on the list you've been trying to figure out. You try and converse with it, but it is an actual heart, so it obviously doesn't work. All you hear are the vacant echoes of the flesh cave. By the time you get out, it's already day 10, and, um... Yeah, I forgot to tell you that the plague, or death, literally came to you in the form of an executor with dim, dead eyes and bones upon its cloak. He told you it would infect every single child on your list, and now, it did. Death appears a couple of times throughout the game, by the way, but this is the most memorable instance. So yeah, good luck with trying to make sure they don't all die painful and horrible deaths tonight. Anyway, Oyun tells you that you need to sleep a bit, and also in a casual fashion that you ought to literally rule the kin and that one of them killed your father. So you set to brewing panaikas for the kids and peacefully go to sleep. What proceeds is this odd and kind of emotional dream where you're in your back at the abattoir, this time speaking with the last surviving Shabnax. I love the music in the background, it's the same song that plays during your father's funeral, though this time it weirdly stops all of a sudden and leaves everything quiet and awkward. What the Shabnax claim is that if you eradicate the plague, you will eradicate them as well. Well, I don't wanna do that, I like the clean bone chicken looking things. But I like humans more, so yeah. Sorry guys, oh. Hi, dad. Wait. What? 
Your father tells you that he let the plague happen so the town would be broken and you could sew it back together. That's basically the gist of it. This is an interesting dilemma for sure. Do the ends justify the means here? Is it okay to bring forth a plague that will kill and torture hundreds of people as long as it proves to be useful in the long run by providing prosperous lives? He claims that the town would have disappeared anyway, but he can't truly know that. It doesn't seem to be the case. And besides, it surely couldn't have been in such a gruesome way. Most towns don't disappear like that. That. Here's an interesting parallel. Would it be okay to say, yes, some odd god, give the four out of the five total people that you created terrible, terrible deaths, as long as that granted you the ability to improve the life of the single remaining person, and then continue creating more and more like them in the future, or simply let them have okay lives instead? The play that night has stellar voice acting, especially on the Heruspex's side. What can I say? I said everything yesterday. It's strange to hear, I thought you were supposed to be the genius. Aglaia claims that she will be executed if she doesn't fix the town before day 12, and uh, since she thinks it's pretty much impossible, it simply comes off as a roundabout way of killing her. There is a solution, however, that she proposes for her problem, and it's fleeing the town. Later that day, the real Aglaia says the same thing. She can also be persuaded into opening up the termitary and letting all the sick people out of there. Honestly, it's kind of a hard choice. You're either breaking quarantine or torturing the hundreds of people that are locked up tightly in that terrible place. And even later, when you visit her, she says that she finally decided. She wants to leave the town with you. Or else, she won't do it at all, even though she fears she'll get killed by the general. Apparently, the Inquisition and the army as a whole have always had some beef going on. Now, I definitely choose Aglaia in the Pathologic Dating Simulator, also known as Pathologic, but I just can't leave the kids to die, you know. Sorry, Aglaia. If you do agree to go with her, however, you set off for taking the train out of town this night. You meet up, get on it, and surprisingly, actually manage to get out of town. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Suddenly, the train holds to a stop. Soldiers are waiting for you outside, and the moment a glass steps out, they shoot her immediately. In all the misfortune this game brings on other people and you, this has to be one of the hardest moments. I mean, you most likely ended up here because you really do care about Aglaia and even abandoned the whole town because of her, and yet, in true pathologic fashion, by trying to help, you're only making things worse. You walk back to the town slowly, even losing time you might have needed now that you have nothing left but to continue helping with the cure. The song that plays perfectly encapsulates the feeling. I, however, didn't do this and didn't have my wife who die. Like you! <laughs> anyway, Aglaia chooses to remain in town if you decline, though she does send three couriers to relay her requests of blowing up the polyhedron. She thinks it's the root of the plague. You have the same goal, though your perfect outcome is withdrawing the polyhedron's sharp end from the earth and allowing its blood to spray freely upon the surface, providing enough cure for everybody. I guess Aglaia's arrival was fortunate after all. Now that that's all done, the rest of the day can be spent running around like a shabnak without a head and trying to cure all of the children. I love the dialogue that they give, it's so sad that they've all pretty much accepted their deaths in their own different ways, and so are the dialogue options you have that claim you ensure their survival, even though you fully know there's a good chance at least one of them will die, if you didn't get the shaken blood like my dumbass anyway. Besides, you probably have other infected people already. And yet, for how dramatic it all is, they don't actually thank you or say anything at all upon getting cured. They never do, but I haven't mentioned it yet since usually them getting sick isn't this emotional. But it was really immersion breaking this time. I know it would have been a lot of trouble to write all the dialogue for every single character getting sick any number of times, so that they don't repeat, which would have been, you know, still bad, but it really, really took me out of this moment. Like, a lot. 
On the morning of day 11 it's raining, doesn't happen very often during the game. Today you have but a single important job, figuring out what happened to the three couriers during the night. You need to carry their papers to the general yourself so he can destroy the polyhedron. They apparently all missed general block and went out looking for somebody else. The first place you stop by is Lara's house. Great. Daniel just couldn't bear to let the story end without showing his assholeness. He has now destroyed one of your three chances at achieving your goal. One of the men decided to go to Daniel, and what does he get? Tankovsky even burned the papers on top of that. Well, okay, he at least has some kind of motive this time, since he wishes to preserve the polyhedron as he believes it's vital for his mission of defeating death. Yeah, right, like you haven't fallen in love with it. Next, you go to Crowstone, where our second courier went. There was a fight there between Longins and the General's people, and it apparently ended up somewhere in the factory at the Broken Heart. There you meet this charming fella. He refuses to let you or the other random person there leave, who's for some reason pretending to be a Burakh, unless you patch up one of the gangster's boys. So you do and get to meet your copy. He claims he's your successor in case you die, and speaks of it very similar to how Mark Immortal does. Your canonical self obviously has no idea what he's talking about, but it still makes you wonder, could it be that it is canonical, that these brief moments after death and your resurrection are actually real? Surely not. Anyway, he also tried to kill the courier, because it was in his script. This is such a great meta explanation, the developers pretty much say, oh, it's not us that wrote it, it's the fictional writer within the story, don't blame us. He did survive though, and is out there somewhere, bleeding to death as you're speaking to your copy, and you have no idea where he is. So you embark for the final place that's left. As you exit the pub, you get confronted by your kin brethren who beg you to not destroy the disease so they don't die. Yeah, about that. When you arrive, you find out the third courier went to the changeling, but another battle broke out between the two sides of the army. She claims she didn't have anything to do with it and simply wanted to help. Yeah, right, like you can actually heal anyone- oh, okay, then damn. Still, for one reason or another, her powers have disappeared for the time being, and this courier has also been killed. The papers have been destroyed in the water and the rest of the soldiers are coming. They will shoot and kill you on sight. You need to sneak through unnoticed and hope that the changeling's babblings about them wanting to kill her, yet her somehow knowing she'll survive, prove to be true. Damn, they really had it in for Aglaia in this game, huh? So you set out to track down the last surviving courier, with no idea where he is. If you fail to find him before 10pm, the lights die out and you wake up at the theater. Peek and Talon mock you for being bad at your job, and so does Clara, claiming she'll do better if she steps on stage, better than both you and The Bachelor. He's also there, practicing his Latin quotes. Mark too says he's done with you, not just you, the actor, as he puts it, but also your character. Interesting, this is some pretty serious foreshadowing about getting the other two campaigns in Pathlogic 2, and this is before they announced they were gonna do it. Yes, they have. Finally, Finally, you enter the closet to take off your outfit and wake up on the train from the start of the game. You are again with the fellow traveler. He claims you'll be bound to each other forever from now on, destined to travel together. The end. The so-called late ending. Of course, you don't suck at the game, so this would never happen. If the first courier went to the Bachelor and the third to the Changeling, it's only natural that the second goes to the Heruspex. And sure enough, you find him in front of your hideout. Dead, but nonetheless there. And the papers are intact. You now have two options. Firstly, burn the papers, or simply don't deliver them up until 10pm, whichever you prefer. You start hearing loud boom wooing before it all fades back to the train again. You chose to let the plague survive instead of the peoples, and the few that remain are to live their lives in a simpler way, closer to Mother Earth. We all return to warm. Sticky says all the streets now look like the old step tales. There are aurochs everywhere. The step has flooded the town and everyone, and so the plague will not harm them anymore, as long as it all remains the same. You can also live peacefully with Murky and Sticky now, in Murky's train car. It's her taking you under her wing in this weird timeline. She was raised by step wolves, not you. She knows Mother Earth best. 
The bachelor got his wish to preserve the polyhedron, yet he hates the final result, and so he leaves. A majority of the remaining bound claim they won't be accepted into the town anymore, and thus they venture into the steppe. It's a mysterious, kind of bittersweet ending. Perhaps it's for the better. Simple people are exempt from complicated problems. You then find yourself at the abattoir, speaking with Oyun and Clara, and afterwards on the stairway to heaven with Aspity. On top of the polyhedron, you meet Taya, Grace and Clara, the three new mysticists, the only ones able to help lead a town that's ruled by the kin. Though, why is Clara here again, and why is she acting as if she didn't meet with you back in the abattoir? Well, there is no timeline, and it all seems kind of dreamy and hazy, so whatever. Most importantly, you get to meet these strange children called the Divisors. They immediately drop the title card, and you quickly grasp what's going on. These are the developers, speaking to you directly about the game that they poured their lives into. We're copying what already existed. It feels wrong to talk to you like this, to confess everything. We used to want to change the world, but now it just feels as if we're trying to translate someone's childhood dreams. This child demands more attention and strength than I have. I'm a messenger, about to be shot for bringing bad news. I'm head deep in the second outbreak. Making this world was a challenge and it shifted the trajectory of my life. I helped a lot with ideas but made few decisions, just how much did I contribute. I hope my participation made it better. I, on the other hand, was introduced very late into it. I hope me helping with it leaves some sort of legacy. I personally like the story. I find such obvious fourth world breaking a little tasteless. It's about the journey, not the destination. I spent five years so you could play this in five days. I don't like it when games tackle quests the usual way. Neither do I, buddy. Neither do I. Afterwards, you meet Sticky at the cathedral and briefly discuss your decision and what it all means. Kin have now settled even in the stone yard, the place that once rejected them the most. Eva Yan wants to be an herb bride, and whilst she has always had that same way of dressing, you decide to discourage her by telling her the brides will eat Eva alive. Finally, you meet Mark at the theater. It always has to come back to him, doesn't it? And here's where they reveal they do The Bachelor next and that it'd be even better this time. Finally, you may choose to either A. Remain Artemi Burach and go back into the town, B. Become the in-game actor or the player and take off your costume exiting the game, or C. Become a tragedian and decide to replace Mark in the theater. The end. The nocturnal ending. And finally, if you manage to deliver the orders, the polyhedron gets shot down and you get to throw the blood from the earth. You chose humans over the kin this time, and thus all miracles have abandoned the step, including the polyhedron. Time to turn off the lights. You get to walk around the town as long as you wish, speaking with every single person that you manage to save, contemplating their fates, their character, since you are seeing them for the last time. Basically, there are three types of pathologic characters. <clears throat> anyway, let's continue. Peter, a depressed alcoholic, tormented by his ideas which he cannot describe or map out to be built. His most ambitious work yet has now been destroyed. He is truly broken, left with nothing. Andre, on the other hand, with a bigger temper, is furious. He refuses to believe you once you confess to him. The bachelor is getting drunk because of the same reason. He will never achieve his impossible dream now and has gained little wealth by coming to this town but terrible memories. Yulia wants to write about you and take you with her to the capital and, you know what? I'm fine with settling for the second best waifu. Anna Angel remains a mysterious character for most of the game. She isn't much involved with the Heruspex. She often lies and seems to be completely devoid of any personality, largely due to the fact that she is hiding it the whole time. She not only has an extreme fear of germs, but also giving away who she truly is. Clara claims she is dying, and it might be a consequence of you getting rid of all the miracles, all the magic in the world. Notkin is of course happy that the polyhedron is gone, so much so that he accepts you into the halves. He wants to build even more warehouses for every little trinket and thing in the world. He also wishes to join the kin. He does seem to respect the value of earthly life, his whole gang in fact. That's weird since during the game the plague seems to target him the most. Oyun is bewildered as to why you spared him even though he killed your father. He confessed to you earlier in the game, stating that he didn't understand why your father would have wished to infect the town on purpose and murdered him in a mad rage. You had the chance to kill him, tell him to kill himself, to live with the guilt, or forgive him. Taya has already taken up to preaching, no grudges, no harming children, and, the most important law, all kids must have sweets. It shows just how ridiculous and kind of scary it is to have such a young child hold the fates of so many people in her hands. Under no pretext should sweets and candy be surrendered, any attempt to disarm the children must be frustrated, by force if necessary. 
As Pity finally confirms that she came from the Earth and because of what you did, she must now go back. She has always had that air of mystery about her and some say she is in fact a Shabnak a deer. Yes, I know they changed it to Shabnak a dig in Pathlogic 2, but the deer sounds way cooler. Also, you get to adopt Sticky and Murky in Descending 2, though this time you live in a proper house, your father's. Rubin is angry at you once again, even though he doesn't believe you killed your father anymore, he has always resented you for leaving the town. Bad Grief apparently knows how time works now after spending so much of it in the cathedral. Before becoming a criminal, he used to be a locksmith. In this version of the game, he was never an intimidating guy, just pretending. He speaks in rhymes and theatrics, and although he doesn't do anything that bad during the game, he doesn't take many steps to stop his men either. He eventually has a falling out with them though during his stay at the cathedral, and partly the barber takes over instead, one that believes they shouldn't use lockpicks instead of knives simply because of stupid traditions. And Lara wants to help you with raising the orphans. With her house being named the shelter and willing to provide you with food, she is very much a caring person. Perhaps a little too much, since she contemplates taking her own life near the end of the game as no one needs her anymore. And what else would you live for then? Oh, and you get to speak with the devisors in this ending as well. Georgi delivers what is undoubtedly the best line in the whole game. Can't we just have a normal town for normal living people, you ask? No. Pretty much pathologic in a nutshell. His brother Victor goes even further than that, claiming that the new town across the river will be even stranger. Houses will write edicts, streets will invent laws. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if Icepeak Lodge managed to pull that off as well were they ever to try. Victor is a calm, intelligent man and you don't spend much time with him during the game. Eva Yan is sitting next to them, listening in, intrigued. She respects the architects and everyone who helped build the town in their own way. Her house, the Stillwater Observatory, was constructed upon her demand by a now dead man named Farad. She has strong opinions as to what should be allowed in the town and not. If she is to die, you can hear her voice whenever passing her home, confirming the kindest philosophy of their buildings containing souls. Maria can be found next to her mother's statue, resentful of you and pretty much everyone else, as always. She is tormented by the fact that she cannot live up to her mother's legacy. She demands respect, but cannot earn it. Maria despises even the little things, like people walking up to her like she's just another person and not the daughter of the great Nina Kaina. Maybe she just doesn't have it in her, or perhaps the feats of the mistresses are overblown. No one can live up to myths, after all. Either way, Maria doesn't care about people. She doesn't wish to do miracles for the sake of helping others, she just wants to be revered. Whether she is a true mistress or not, she sure is a dark one. Young Vuat, on the other hand, has become absolutely based, deciding to forbid child labor, provide insurance, benefits for disabled workers, an 8-hour workday and, in general, better pay. He doesn't love either, like his mother, the bright Victoria did. What he does believe in, however, is transactional relationships. If you treat others with respect, they will usually do the same. His father has started preparing him for inheritance, as Big Vlad 7 decade is just around the corner. He still plans to continue his work, however, if possible, though the Bull Enterprise might just be dead. With the Kynes possibly no longer on this side of the river and though Gimski's bow enterprise over, Savorov remains the sole ruler of the town, for better or worse. He has a strong sense of duty, but it can sometimes push him to extreme measures whenever he cannot solve a problem. When he realizes he has no chance of catching Isidore's killer, he resorts to incriminating random people, calling it to him every other day to confront them together. They are never even remotely suspicious. His wife Katarina decides to manage the cathedral. She has abandoned her pursuit of becoming a mistress, lifting the giant weight off her shoulders. She now has a realistic purpose, which won't push her to abusing opioids. She is unable to bear children, which hurts her greatly and even pushes her to adopt Clara on a whim, and mere days later, today, also Grace. It's still obviously better for the girl than living with Peter, who couldn't take care of her with an addiction of his own. Even her real parents used to be addicted to Irene before their passing. Grace scares immensely for the dead, as she has spent most of her life in the cemetery. She knows neither numbers nor letters, but her new parents have promised to teach her. As the leader of the town's kids, Capella is both strict like Vlad and kind like Victoria. She is mature for a teenager and acts like a mother for the children, one that can understand them and guide them at the same time. Han, on the other hand, is the leader of the Dogheads. They are planning to get married, uniting their two noble families and leaving behind the previous utopian ideas of the Bow Enterprise and Polyhedron. Already being two of the leaders of the town's children beforehand, they are for sure to be respected and loved by the generation whenever it grows up. The town's future is honestly starting to look more and more promising. 
and you find the changeling once again. In the end, it turns out to be true. There are in fact two changelings, though this Clara gets to live since she's the one that lost her powers, I guess. The other is a personification of the plague, of death. This one is planning her future as a mistress. And finally, it all ends like the nocturnal ending, with the theater. Everything is pretty much the same. You speak with Marky Mortel, the only major character in the game that can neither get sick nor die. Nobody ever mentions where he came from, and no one ever questions it. He has no private life, no hobbies, no interests beside the theater and your fate. One can only wonder. The end. The diurnal ending. This is the one I got. However, there is actually another ending, the Dio ending. Upon dying for the seventh time, you won't get to meet with Mark, but the fellow traveler. He offers to remove your penalties forever in exchange for taking something from the real you. He refuses to clarify what it is or even how much it will hurt you. At first, this seemed like a chance to activate a slight easy mode, a here's the change difficulty option in case you're struggling kind of thing, so I declined. I mean, he even phrased it as removing the unique vision. And it does do that, but it also does something quite interesting too. Upon choosing an ending, it doesn't actually happen. In fact, nothing happens. You simply burn the papers or give them to the general or don't find them and then get a map marker for the theater. For the second time in the game since the introduction of the plague, the mini tragedians are all pointing you towards your destination. Other than that, the town is desolate, dead. When you arrive, Beacon Talon inform you that you've signed the contract that prevents you from ending the performance. At all. Clara once again dogs on you and The Bachelor for being bad actors, and he's still rehearsing his lines. Mark, on the other hand, is furious and disappointed that you took the easy way out. You didn't just lower the game's difficulty, which would have been fine, you disabled the core part of the experience, the punishment for dying, and thus destroyed his vision for the play. He feels betrayed and therefore refuses to let you play anymore. It's done. He's disappointed in you as a character once again, which actually feels weird since it's really the actor that screwed up here, but nonetheless, everything else is much the same as the late ending. You and the Traveler are bound together nonetheless. The end of Act 4, which was the arrival of the army, the discovery of the cure, the death of Aglaia, and the end of it all. Okay, what the hell was all that? Surreal, but damn, get comfortable, we have a lot to discuss. Firstly, do you remember at the start of the video when I told you that you'll recall the prologue at the end and realize how it's a gaze into the last day of the game? Yeah, it's... it's not. It's even better than that, that was the first game. There you get to meet in the cathedral and choose the ending. When Mark says he's going to try again, he's talking about redoing the whole path logic, the whole play. He is the one that's pulling the strings, he is the one that employs you, the actor, to play the character Artemy after all, it's very obvious for most of the game. This isn't the only time the first pathologic is mentioned by the way, but it's usually very meta, the events didn't actually happen, it's more the developers mentioning it or perhaps the theater director in game since it all seems to be a play as we said. Something Pathologic 2 does way better than 1 is subtlety. In the last game, we had a secret encounter for curing two thirds of the bound, a meeting with the powers that be. The powers that be are two kids playing in their backyard, and basically everything that you had experienced up until then was revealed to be them playing in the sand. Yes, it's an it was all a dream kind of thing, but I actually really liked it. H Bomber guy said it better than I ever could, but still, long story short, combined with the later review of meeting the developers, it teaches you that this kind of thing shouldn't ruin your experience. This kind of reveal doesn't diminish anything, since it was always a game credited for you by somebody else. It's a totally awesome twist in my opinion. Anyway, I love that moment, but it isn't present in Pathlogic 2. Like, not at all. We only get some appearances from the powers that be without them actually mentioning anything about it. 
What we get instead, however, are all the mentions, metaphors and themes of the theater allegory that we have. It's not a sudden reveal, so it won't upset anyone in the first place. It's always there, instead of condensing that one cool moment in the end, which just leaves the rest of the already empty game feeling even emptier. In the first game, you get to meet the developers, much like in 2, at the end of the game, if you manage to keep every bound safe and uninfected. Sure, the theater idea is still present, but nowhere near as much as Pathologic 2, where it gets brought up all the damn time. I can't stress this enough, they really up the ante in 2. So many different times do we see the blurring of in-game story in-game theater that acts out the story and out-of-game developer, the whole death mechanic, the tumor, the rat prophet and them seemingly being an in-world thing, your clone, the tragedians that reflect people's struggles and thoughts and you being able to speak to them, the theater lights, the actual lines in the skies which could be a fragment of your imagination, or not, the quotes, what you refer to zeros and ones are actual people and the people who fed you this thought, aka the developers, meeting the actual developers in the ending, even a cool subtle detail like not finding the papers and not delivering or burning the papers having a different outcome, hinting to the fact that it's a play centered on you that has an ending according to how you did and whether it was intentional and not what's realistic. Many things are left up to interpretation. What part of this exists and what is a hallucination? On which layer of existence is it? Is something you'll find yourself wondering again and again during your time with this game. What is probably my favorite when it comes to the theater is that knowing the lines could simply refer to knowing the lines in a play. This idea of being an actor in a play and a player in a game also brings up discussions of free will, not so much those of metaphysics, of determinism, based, and libertarianism, cringe, or compatibilism, even more cringe, but rather a discussion of exactly that, actors and players. You can only have as much agency as the director decides. Pathlogic 2 leaves you a ton of wiggle room, more than most games, and yet you're only but an actor. An interesting trend that I noticed, even though it sometimes contradicts others within the game, is that the Earth cares not for petty human disputes. Katarina, for example, is called the Earth Mistress and also the one that sits in the center in between the White and Dark Mistresses. It shows that Mother Earth takes no side in our pursuits of good and bad. The world holds no opinions as to whether something that is possible should be done or not. Something either is or isn't. The only people that punish you for certain actions are the humans. There's also the most blatant idea of the new ways versus the old ways, industrialization going against the ancient cultures, perhaps it literally destroying the earth through climate change, trying to change our human purpose like the Kynes and the Neil by pursuing immortality only to hurt earth in the process through the polyhedron. The relationship between the different cultures is also portrayed as rather complicated. They don't oppose each other directly, in fact most of the time they seem to work together. The ordinary townsmen believe in the myths somewhat, it's just a part of the culture, whether they think about it at all or not, though they definitely don't practice it like the kin. Still, they never cut bodies open or dig holes. Townspeople also have tribal tapestries and paintings in their houses, bull heads on their playgrounds or marking their food shops and so on. It's more the leaders of each group that are in opposition here. Still, even the rival kid gangs are on one side the closer to Earth so on a house, and on the other the utopian dockheads. Speaking of the kids, they are most often portrayed as not innocent little humans, but simply adults who happen to be childish. They are just as cruel and cunning, poisoning animals, having gang wars. This becomes very interesting when we look at how the polyhedron is implied to stop children's growth, to keep them young forever. Sure, they remain small and children-like, still playing their little games, but the more time they spend on this earth, the more they become harsher. Although not every child resides in the polyhedron currently, the majority of them used to be there before they ran away. and a lot still do. Finally, after going through the whole game, we can talk a little about performance. Pathlogic has some issues on PC. I thought the slow opening of doors was just me, but streamers with specs way better than mine seem to get it as well. It's not that bad and it won't get me killed or something like that, but it still sucks. And that's not the end of it, the game usually runs pretty well for how it looks, sure, but even in general there was a lot of stuttering, looting a body, rummaging through a trash can, opening your inventory or map, and just very often randomly as you're walking through the town. Simply one of those would've been okay, but having all of that definitely soured my experience a lot. Like, really. I guess at least, despite it feeling like the game was going to crash any second, it never did. Well, we did stutter for an eternity once, which forced me to out F4, and that's, you know, 
terrible with the saving mechanic. When it comes to bugs, I have almost no complaints. A play in the theater got stuck once and I couldn't exit, so I had to load the latest save. It was simply because the plague in my head spoke over the actors in the beginning, I think, so the play never started. Then it happened again, though this time the models weren't loaded when the lights came on and that might have been it. Also, when getting sick for the first time, you wake up with the soul and a half skits surrounding you. They give you a schmauder for it, but my inventory was full, so I dropped it and when I tried to pick it up, it wasn't there. Finally, I got stuck in a couch once. It's still definitely better than Pathologic 1 concerning the bugs. When it comes to performance, I can't know how it was back in the day, but Pathologic 2 definitely isn't the best. After finishing the campaign for the first time, you may also embark on a smaller though still interesting adventure, the Marble Nest, wherein you spend one day as the Bachelor. By the way, I'll be referring to it as a demo since I got no better word even though I don't necessarily believe it is one, you'll see later. Anyway, you start off already in the middle of the nightmare, the stone yard, the last uninfected part of the town has fallen victim to the plague. Aspity tells you that death is waiting for you downstairs. You meet one of your orderlies, THE orderly now, since all the others are dead. You let him go, since it's all over anyway. He will at least get the small break before he dies. Morat, on the other hand, who is furious with you, jumps you and so you're forced to kill him. Finally, you meet with the executor, death itself. It tells you that you ought to accept the plague and death in general. If you accept, you do die and the game ends with this screen. Sometimes death is not the end, but merely a new beginning. But not in this case, this loss was pointless, it teaches nothing. Of course, you don't choose this and instead exit the house and soon after get woken up by Sticky. So it was a nightmare for now. Apparently, Blackie's stepfather, who? has fallen ill, though not of the sand pest. Also, Georgi Kain came looking for you earlier, but even more important than that, he tells you to never give nuts to Shrew. Right. You go and find out Blackie's dad died of a stroke. Again, you meet that mysterious executor who doesn't seem to be an orderly until you flip him off and talk to him again and now he is. You meet Aspiti and she wishes to tell you the meaning of your dream but can't since you wouldn't understand because, and I quote, you mix up death, death, and death. They are not the same. You also come across the girl Sticky said you mustn't give nuts to and she asks you for nuts. She also says something pretty odd and anyway it's we who are overseeing you, you're dreaming us anyway, got it? Well this does seem like a very thorough experience but to be fair when hasn't that logic felt that way? She wants you to die it turns out according to Sticky at least and also according to Shrew who admits it when she gets upset that you gave Sticky the nuts just like that. She also does it again, she fucks with you, tells you you're infected and raving right now, that they're looking after you, claims you aren't standing outside right now and yet she also wants you to die so you can be put inside a nut, of course. The kid called Sleepyhead on the other hand wants to do it with two people from the house nearby. You go check up on them since they might be infected but they've locked themselves in and you have no lockpick. You meet some people that hate your guts since you closed down the food stores. A man even went to the judge because he thought you would kill him. You come across a soldier that says he scared some kids off for trying to break into a house. We have some very odd dialogue here where you can either ask him to hand lockpicks over or ask why the tenants here were evicted and... I guess that's an important choice that matters, since if you chose the latter, you can't ask for the lockpicks anymore. No speaking with the possibly ill people back there it is then, I guess. Of course, Georgi has decided to end the quarantine even though he believes the sand pest is still among us. Oh, classic Georgi, he just wants the plague to filter the town's population and only leave the strong people behind. For real though, messing with time seems to have made all the kinds somewhat insane. Also, the man who came to his mansion to hide from you was a carrier, and Georgi let him go. You talk with the clerks about God and how humans don't get enough life to explore themselves fully and, once again, different cultures living alongside each other. Man, if the Bachelor campaign was sprinkled with this much philosophical and political discussions then I'm all for it. Anyway, the tragedians tell you that you have no heart and, yeah, just shit on you. You can perform a surgery on a worm outside of town and receive a heart as a reward, which you can then give to the tragedians. You can give them a literal heart. This might just be the most smug and bachelor thing ever. 
They then tell you that in order to beat the game you must understand its rules and break them. I'll keep that in mind. The other Lees on the other hand thought you were dead and fled to their homes, celebrated your victory for the stone yard or embarked into the other districts to help with the bodies. I guess that's why Georgie Kanye is in charge now. They all really believe your death, except for orderly number 12. You were always my favorite. Yeah, the soldiers kind of murdered all the protesters too. You then find a guarded house and enter to be greeted by the plague. The tragedian tells it to you straight up, you need to face death, you can't run away from it. But there is nothing to run away from, just some scary sounds that lower your immunity but give you just enough time to explore and loot everything before you find a coffin. Oh, you loot a pocket watch from it and I guess that turns time back or something because the house isn't infected anymore and you can just loot it again, though you keep your old items as well. After that, there really isn't anything to do until nightfall when the plague spreads through the stone yard and all is lost. Do you remember the two people that you couldn't get to because of that dumb lockpick dialogue choice? Well, they were the carriers and they believed that the sand pest would make them immortal. But even if you got to them, other carriers would have managed to somehow get in over the barricades. Some things just aren't bound to happen, and the stone yard survival is one of them. The bridge square remains as the last uninfected district. The atrium and the cape are both gone. The orderlies are going around giving false orders in your name, they're burning corpses. The three cool guys you talked to earlier are now tragedians. A worm was killed because they thought he was the carrier, and word has spread that you are dead. People gather in front of your house to pay their respects to the Newton Koski. In the house you find the three kids, orderly number 12 and Aspity. It's all almost over now, you spend the majority of your time desperately struggling to keep the dream from coming true, but it's impossible, because that was the dream. You are already infected and dying, and so is most of the district. And yet you're hallucinating, delirious, still trying to save the town. You cannot let death take you, but you must. You meet death, the sound plague, the executor once again. If you refuse to die, you are greeted with this message. I knew the day begins. This is also a way of conquering death, to return once again to the time petrified. And again, and again. It's a cycle, a pause. Things will change, and the day starts anew. So it all begins once again, with the terrible nightmare and getting woken, and you know the rest. If you agree to die on the other hand, you die. The transition is real, and the timeline continues, so does the eternity I call myself, more emotion, less words, they are all obsolete, it's all different now. The end. There is a fourth one however, if you gave the heart to the tragedians, you can ask to be given some time to collect your thoughts, and then question the rules. You deny his right to exist, for which he congratulates you, and is confused as to whether it's the bachelor speaking, or you, the player, who must, as a reminder, one day also make the same choice when it comes to death. The laws we think immutable are false, the laws of nature that dictate morality, the laws of games we play, well done, one doesn't have to follow them indefinitely, rules are made to be changed. The final ending. So what the hell does this all mean? Let's start with the phrase marble nest, it can mean a couple of things. First of all, it's clearly a reference to Aspect Lodge 2013 mobile game Knock Knock, wherein after completing the level Everything's Alive, you are presented with the following text, blah 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 blah, here birdies gather around the marble nest. But why? Why is that the title? The most obvious thing that comes to mind at first that it could refer to is the stone yard, the place you're trying to save from the plague the whole time. It can also refer to a grave, you know, where people go to die. I think there was some discussions about death in this demo, but I'm not quite sure. However, it likely means just the town as a whole, since at one point in the Heru Specs is played to, an herb bride refers to the town as a marble nest. Of course, the term can have multiple meanings, whether it was intended or not. Continuing, the whole sequence is obviously the bachelor's delirious nightmares as he approaches death, the only thing he's been fighting all this time. We already went over the endings, you can die a useless death, you can refuse to die running away from it though you may never hide and will have to confront it eventually, you can die a good death by accepting it, or you can break the rules. That last one is a little ambiguous, breaking the rules could refer to the bachelor's lifelong quest of defeating death, 
breaking the rules of humanity. It doesn't seem like something that he could achieve in his lifetime, rather ironic, and yet you'll seem to bait it. I honestly don't really get this ending. It's a fourth wall breaking one since he speaks to you at one point, not the bachelor, though I still don't think I understand. I guess it's supposed to be you refusing to beat an alien instead contemplating your own life and death. Here's an interesting detail, you start off the demo with a watch, just a normal one that says it has stopped because its owner recently died. At one point Sticky will ask you for the time and if you don't have the watch you can answer, sorry I lost my watch. This is some nice foreshadowing that the bachelor is already dead, but wait I thought he was dying. Probably. Or maybe he's just on the verge of death, perhaps even literally, he appears dead to others and his body shows the same but his consciousness hasn't completely evaporated yet, like he's in some weird state in between existence. You might also remember finding a watch in that coffin in the death house, that was your watch, your coffin, your death. That's what you confronted there, perhaps the future, perhaps something that's already happened. Another probably not intended and rather silly interpretation of the Marble Nest as a whole is that it's the classic bad logic experience of reloading the latest save, knowing full well you screwed yourself a day or two ago, but refusing to go back that far and replay it all. Next, the Marble Nest isn't really a demo, it's a completely separate experience from the original Path Logic 1 Bachelor campaign and also the upcoming Path Logic 2 one. That's what the developers say anyway. However, it does share the general vibe of being the Bachelor, so it's a demo in that regard. You know, the philosophical discussions, the facts and logic, and also the whole fighting death thing. That was... that was a lot. There's only one thing remaining we can really talk about. We already discussed the new additions and the changes between Path Logic 1 and 2, but what isn't different about those two games that came out 14 years apart? Well, the core philosophy of Path Logic remains the same. Path Logic is not a game about winning the race, you just need to do as much as possible, that's all. Most games require you to follow some kind of route, to be the winner, the good guy, the hero, but Path Logic lets you crawl your way to the track field and pass out a couple of times, in the end getting a result possibly not much better than not getting to the end at all. In that way, simply finishing Path Logic is not really a clear achievement, it doesn't spell success by itself or even say anything at all about how your playthrough went for that matter. You could have succeeded at almost every task and left close to no one dead, just as you could have done the exact opposite, ignoring everything whilst you desperately search for food, letting everyone die and arriving alone at the end. It probably won't be that bad even on your first playthrough, you'll probably do pretty well, but you will always fail at something. Bad logic is about stress and frustration, which happen to be some of the emotions a game should be able to invoke in you the most, if not the best ones. Bad logic is also about losing control. Losing control is fun, as long as it's done right and clearly intended for the experience. It can make me incredibly immersed, I keep saying to myself, this is so unfair, half of my time has already passed, I haven't found the cure and I can't do anything about it, all of the kids are about to get infected and I can't do anything about it, the inquisition made it so I can't buy food and I can't do anything about it, I hate being in this town, I hate being Artemi Burach. There is an idea about storytelling that states using bad luck to put your characters in terrible situations is great, doing the opposite not so much. Seems hypocritical at first but let's take a look at an example. It's literally the same thing but for some reason one feels so much worse than the other. Bad luck, the main characters are fighting the bad guy and he gets reinforcements at the right time, gets lucky and escapes, etc. Whereas good luck is more like, the MC's friends arrive at the last second right before they were about to get executed. It just makes you say, do you think I'm that stupid? Come on, if you use good luck to solve a problem for the main character, then you're only showing to everyone that you don't have a good and satisfying way of solving it. It feels cheesy. Using bad luck just doesn't, I don't really have any other way to put it, that's the way it is. Our main characters are usually those who get stuff thrown at them all the time, not the other way. I'm usually not interested in watching someone that can get through any problem, no problem. With bad luck, as long as it's not overdone and or exaggerated, it will usually make me go, oh no, how did that happen, they're so screwed now, I wonder how they're gonna get out of that one, but good luck is rather, oh, okay, I guess. 
But why am I saying this? Well, I think it stands true for path logic. You lose control and the game screws you over and now it's on you to get out of it. Imagine if instead Ruben was like, hey dude, I made a panacea, I'll give you one if you got sick during a particularly hard part of the game. A similar scenario does happen in the game where you need to get a free schmouder the first time you get sick, as we mentioned. But this isn't really the same thing, since it's basically telling you, here, it's your first time, so you get away just this once, we got it out of the way, no more holding your hand, you're on your own now. The equivalent would be a character getting saved by luck at the beginning of a book, whereas if it was in the middle or end, it's more like, nah, okay. Now let's talk a little about types of fun, yes, that's actually a thing, it goes as follows. 1. Fun in the moment and fun to remember, think skiing. 2. Not that fun in the moment, but fun to remember, think getting lost in the woods. 3. Not fun in the moment and not fun to remember, think getting abducted and tortured. And there is also 4, which is fun in the moment, but not fun to remember, just something ordinary like taking a nice walk. Some people also swap the numbers at times, but it's generally the same ideas. Path logic is, to me, at least in some aspects, very clearly intended to be type 2 fun. Well, I guess it depends on how your playthrough went, some people might go with 3, understandably. Anyway, the game is incredibly fun to reminisce about and I often find that type 2 fun can be sometimes the best fun. After all, what is that one moment of the action compared to the years and years that'll follow during which you'll keep remembering it? Sure, I can remember playing, I don't know, what's some very fun game, Doom Eternal. But I can also reminisce about wiping on a raid boss in WoW Classic all damn night until we finally beat it, then go to bed at sunrise. I like suffering, and I like Bad Logic too. It's an amazing game from a studio that knew fully well their style wasn't going to be for everyone, and that they possibly might not have made much profit. 30 euros is definitely worth it, even for a single playthrough, let alone the fact that it has pretty good damn replayability. If I could summarize the whole game in one sentence, yeah I know how ridiculous that sounds looking at the video's length, I would say, Path Logic 2 is what Path Logic 1 wanted to be, and so much more. I probably missed a thing in this review, or had something go over my head, or was straight up wrong about some stuff, but that's only natural with such a game. I can't even imagine how much work goes into crafting such an intricate and complicated world with realistic characters, dozens of different themes and ideas, the culture, the genius way the game plays, but I can for sure respect and appreciate it. And that's why I'm gonna give Path Logic 2 a mid 9 out of 10. Oh, and uh, the Marmo Nest is like uh, an 8, mid 8, yeah. Hey, thank you for watching this video and also being patient with how long it took to make. I had to play through Path Logic 2, play through Path Logic 1's second campaign, and you know, this is kind of a deeper game than most. Oh, and I was also on vacation for a week, away from my computer, and I've written two other scripts in the meantime, so those videos will come out way faster. Anyway, make sure to ring the bell, share, like, comment, watch my other videos and all of that, check out my rating list if you're interested, I also keep all my video ideas and what I'm currently working on there, it's linked to my channel. And as always, subscribe if you like this type of content and want to see more of it, thanks for sticking around, and I'll see you in the next video.